Aleluya. Praise the Lord. Praise, oh, my right phone. Praise the Lord, everybody. Hallelujah. Whew. I'm sure glad there's a well we can go to. Whenever we're thirsty, God is there to fill us. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. I want to welcome those that are watching on our website or YouTube or Facebook or World Christian, um, Christian World <laughs> Media. Hallelujah. Um, we pray that this message will touch you. Hallelujah. Praise God. God is good. Hallelujah. No sleeping back there. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. So my message this morning is going to be on are you equipped? It's important to have the right equipment to go into any battle, isn't it? And we are in a battle, aren't we, Brother Kim? Hallelujah. For the hearts of everybody. Men, women, children, hallelujah. So my scripture we're going to open up with is in Ephesians chapter 4, 11 through 16. And hopefully this works. Hallelujah. All right? Amen. Starting at verse 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love, did it change? Yes. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him on all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by the, that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual work, it, working in the measure of every part, making, in, maketh increase of the body and to the edifying of itself, of love. So we are here for a purpose. We're all called to do something. Hallelujah. Not just to keep a pew warm. It's to minister. Actually, the Great Commission is for us to go out into all the world, right? Preach the gospel. Now, I'm going on 40 years being saved this fall. Whew. It's a long time, doesn't it? It seems like. And I probably have heard thousands of messages but as I'm going to be honest, the vast majority of them I don't remember. I couldn't recall. Probably, probably a dozen of them that really I could quote pretty close to what they were. And it's not to say that those didn't have an effect on me. They may have an effect on my faith, on my uh, trust, in, trust in the Lord. But to, to actually think about them and say, wow, I, I remember that sermon on uh, December 12th. 1985, I couldn't do it. I still got some cassettes at home that I can go back and listen to. Cassettes, guys. You know what a cassette is, Micah? Oh, well, sure he does. Hallelujah. Amen. But, you know, again, that's not to say that those were bad messages. They were well prepared. And, and if we're going to be honest, most of the messages we hear our, our motivational messages, aren't there, in the churches? They kind of get you all pumped up and excited, and you go out there. Especially by evangelists. They're always, you know, they know when to, to put the right. And Jesus said! And get you all pumped up. But when you leave, you have that same feeling. You may be excited for that night on the ride home or whatever, but many times after service, um, that you know, it blew your mind, and you got very excited to go out and change the world for Christ. The next day, you got up as usual, right? You got dressed, ate breakfast, made your lunch, went to work, put in your eight hours, then came home, and nothing really changed. Again, that's not the fault of a preacher, but that's just the way we are, aren't we? 
Can anyone in here remember the message that we had last week that Bob preached? <laughs> so you probably had the on the resurrection. Amen. How about two weeks ago? It was the resurrection. Yeah, you had a guest come out here and do a thing. How about three weeks ago? He <laughs> said, Jesus. Oh. No, he preached, preached on the blood, the shedding of the blood. Without the shedding of blood, no remission of sins. So, it's, it, and again, it, it's, it's not to say that the message was bad or that we we're bad people because we can't remember what we call what it actually was speaking. But that's just the way it is. I said most of the messages are motivational that we have. So I, I, it came to my, I mean, I was thinking about this through the week. And actually there was a post a couple of weeks ago that Dave had on there on the purpose of, of, the, ministers, of the pastors and how they're supposed to uh, actually equip you to go out there and share the gospel. And I was thinking on that. And I said, that's exactly right. We're not supposed to hear, exactly here to pump you up and give you dramatic messages and that you'll never forget or share my great my knowledge of the Word of God. You know, I can tell you about the, uh, the missing day in the Bible. Does anybody ever hear about that? Some have. Hallelujah. How about David's men of valor? There was a man that went down to a snow pit and slew a lion. Wow. But what were those? Those are great thoughts and great ideas, but is that a message that would actually touch the heart of people and stay with you and equip you to go out there into the world. Now, I, when I was thinking about it, I took a, taking a, I'm taking it kind of personal. So that our job as leaders is to equip you guys to go out there and share the gospel and to do what you're out. And you guys, vice versa, can equip others to do what they have do. We all are called for a purpose, aren't we? So what is the purpose of the church? In Acts 2.42, it says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. Yep. Hey, it's working today. Praise God. And, and breaking of bread and in prayers. In Hebrews chapter 10, 23 to 25, it says, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. For he is that f- faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembly together of ourselves together as a manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see that day approaching. So what is our purpose, brother? <laughs> Waking up. Our purpose is to gather together, break bread, encourage one another, and the steadfast, especially when you see that day approaching, we build each other up. And I, you know, to be, to be honest, I don't know how the first churches were at the beginning. I don't, I'm sure there wasn't like gathering like this, was it, Brother Dave? The Bible said they gathered in homes. They probably were all sitting down on the dust, and they probably all, there may be one specific speaker or one specific person they had it up, but then it, it was everybody kind of shared what they had or what they are learning about God. They didn't have the Bible, per se, until later on. I think it was about, what, 40 or 50, several years after Christ died, that they had the written Bible in their hands. So that it was mainly by experience or what they have had uh, experienced in their, their walk with God. So the question is this morning is, are you being equipped? 1 Peter 3.15 says, but Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So we're all supposed to have the ability to go out there and tell other people about our faith. You should be able to defend your faith. We don't have really any new believers in here. Some of you guys have been around for a while. Right, D? I said, I, I'm going to... Oh, no laughing over there, Tammy. Hallelujah. We can ask Sister Betty how long she's been in this thing. She's been old, in it old, longer than I've been alive, I think, wasn't it? 19, 1957? Yeah. Praise God. Hallelujah. <laughs> Whew. Those are the people we need to go to ask questions of because they have, you have all the answers, right, Betty? 
<laughs> Hallelujah. But those are the ones that are experienced in, in, our, in our faith. And we should be able to defend our faith. We should be able to when, talk to somebody about why we believe marriage is between one man and one woman. Can you? Why we believe in baptism in Jesus' name. Why we believe in being filled with the Holy Ghost. Hebrews 6, 1 through 3 says this. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on into perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptism, the laying of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this will we do if God permit. These are something you should all be solid in. Now, I appreciate some people. There's, some people are very bold. Sister Cindy, I appreciate when you po- she posts some stuff on Facebook because I know she's going to get attacked. David, hey, he just, <laughs> he's an automatic. He posts something, and you know he's going to get attacked. Hallelujah. And, that, you know, and we need to be strong in that, not fearful of what people are going to say. We're more excited about posting what we ate last night than what the Word of God says. Let's be strong in that, don't we? And thank you, Cindy. Thank you, Dave. And thank you for others. Kim with his writings and stuff like that. Thank you for posting that stuff. Because that's, that's a good avenue to get the Word of God out, isn't it, Cindy? They don't like it. But it's true. We This is our... Our tool, isn't it? The big equipment that we have, isn't it? Second Timothy three sixteen to seventeen says in the Amplified, every scripture is God breathed, given by His inspiration, and profitable for instruction, for reproof and conviction of sin, for correction of error and discipline and obedience, and for training in righteousness. That is holy living in conformity conformity to God's will and thought purpose, and action, so that the man of God may be complete and proficient, well-fitted, and thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, we as a church are guilty of telling you the whys, or not, not even the whys, but telling you to do something, but not telling you the whys or how, sorry. I, haven't, I can't recall too many messages outside of Bible studies that were sat in that really taught us the how to present the gospel or who, how, how to, to back up what you believe in. And I, and I take that personal. So the sermons might be a little longer from now on. No, just kidding. <laughs> in the thousands of messages I've heard in my lifetime, I can narrow it down to this problem. Most messages tell that they need to receive Jesus Christ in their heart and that you need to read the Word God to learn who he is, and you need to pray to have that communication with our Savior. The problem is many times we don't tell them why other than what I just said there, or don't tell them how. Remember disciples often came to Jesus and asked him questions? Didn't they ask Jesus how to pray? These are Jews. They should know how to pray. But they saw something in Jesus that was different in his prayer life. And they wanted to be able to do that. So they asked him, teach us to pray. Now, some people say verbatim, the Lord's Prayer, and I'm not saying that's wrong. But he said this is an example how to pray. Our our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive those that trespass against us. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Nothing wrong with saying that prayer. But if you really want to think about it, it's just a, a, I guess a, how would you say it? Outline. Amen. That's it, brother. An outline of how to pray. My father, you know, you start with the first part, just praising God. You be specific on your needs. Pray for others. Pray for forgiveness of others. Have a forgiving heart. We need that. You know, I was this morning driving in, and uh, I was going under the bridge on uh, by the hospital there because there was a train over there. 
And this el older feller pulled up and was in front of me, and he was turning left, and I was going to go right. And he stopped right in the middle instead of getting over left. And right away, I'm going, <laughs> I'm thinking not too good of thoughts. And I had, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me for that. Don't let me hold that against this guy. I have to do that all the time. I have to have that forgiveness. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lord knows how many times I offended somebody. Right, D? <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. But you have to have that. Yeah, and often Jesus, what, taught and what did he teach mostly in? Parables. Amen. And a lot of times they weren't clear cut, and Jesus had to explain to them the parable of the sower. They came to him, well, what are you talking about, these four soils, Lord? And he had to explain, to each, explain each one of them to them. And that's what we need to be doing as, as leaders, as people in, the, in here. When someone asks us a question, we need to just not, not, not tell, tell them why. Well, you need Jesus because you're a sinner. Well, how do you know I'm a sinner? Well, the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Well, I'm a good person. Are you? The Bible says there's no one good but God. Have you ever told a lie? Come on, be truthful. Amen. Have you ever coveted something? Come on, kids. Christmas time. Commercials. I want that. You can look at every one of those commandments, and we probably have break them every day. I have never murdered anybody. Well, the Bible says you hate somebody. You commit murder. Paul told us in Romans 10, 17 that this, that so then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But is that all that's to that message? We, we some, uh, and I don't like doing this, and, and I, I, I'm getting more at that. I don't do it. I don't just don't read one verse. I read the verses before and after. Because I always think, take things out of context, can't you? And people do. And, you know, I remember sitting in, in uh, Surfer True classes, and they were telling me things, and Later on, I read, the, and I, read, I read the verses before, and that says, that's not what it says. Not that I'm opposed to search for truth classes, but they were misquoting the word, taking it out of context. Ladies, you should know that about dress and hair and stuff like that. Hallelujah. But it's read the verses before that, 13 through 16. For whom, is it still working? Aha. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him who they have not believed? How should then how shall they believe in him who has not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah said, Lord, who hath believed our report? And then it says, That's the verse we just read. Faith come by hearing and hearing of the word of God. So we have to take that personally. That's our job to tell them about Jesus. They can't believe in whom they have not heard of. It, and that, you know, that wasn't a problem 40, 50 years ago. But nowadays it's a problem. People don't know about Jesus. They're raised up in the educational system that teaches them that there is no God. That there is no Jesus. There is no Bible. The Bible is a bunch of fairy tales and lies. It teaches racism. Are you able to defend yourself against those attacks? We have to equip ourselves. And I'm taking it personally that my job is to equip you guys, isn't it? Jesus was a teacher. In Matthew 4, 23, Jesus went about all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogue, God's teaching and preaching the gospel of the kingdom of, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. 
Nicodemus called him rabbi. We know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. What was Jesus' primary way of teaching or, t- or talking to people? By teaching. It wasn't getting up there and, you need Jesus! And I'm not against emotion. I get emotional at times. But sometimes they, they take that and put that in place of God's word. They know how to say, and you know, I was listening. I get turned off by these preachers that say, you know, you know they, they know the dialect perfectly. And Jesus says, Come to me, and you will be saved. That turns me off. I don't know about you. I want to hear the gospel as Jesus would have said it. Jesus would have said, Come to me. I'll eat that labor. And I will give you rest. In the modern day church, the emphasis has been putting more on worship. And then, yeah, I love worship, don't get me wrong. And short sermons, not so much in teaching. But ironically, a recent survey among evangelicals shows that people want just the opposite. Fewer than 10% want shorter sermons, while neither 30% want more in depth teaching. The younger adults, like you, Gus, where'd you go? And even smaller than that, only 7% of them want shorter sermons. So watch out, guys. And, I, and I'm, you know, I think we need to respect other people's time. But sometimes we sell God short by shortening what he has, the message he has. Especially when it comes to teaching. There's probably not a, a message I can actually teach in under an hour. And I'm not saying I would do that. I mean, he may have some two-parters coming up. Hallelujah on that. But it's important that, that to learn the hows to what the Word of God says. Having the proper equipment is important. The Bible charges parents to tramp a child in the way they should go, right? Right, Nicole? We in the church have the responsibility to train and equip those who God has entrusted us with. Now, having the proper equipment is important. When you, when you start, you know, when I started out buying equipment, when I bought my first house, I didn't have a lot of tools. Screwdriver, you know, you ladies use the, the knife as your screwdriver. I know that for a fact because I've seen some of the ends of those knives. Hallelujah. But we didn't have a lot of tools. Well, when I was young, we didn't have power tools as we have today, right, Brother David? It was pretty much hand, hand tools. If you had a, a, everything was electric. Power drill, electric drill, that. But as you grow older or get more um, established, you start buying the better equipment. You know, I was working with a, a friend of mine, and you know, he, he was a, a contractor, so he has every bit of tool that you could imagine. And when I was do projects with him, I was start, start seeing it. You know, wow, what well, that tool? You know, he had a clamp for Clint when doing. Uh, cabinets. So you clamp the cabinets together and, and pulls them there and pushes them in so they're all flat. Boy, that's a nice tool. Of course, I had to get one. When you're doing windows, brother, will just a hammer and a screwdriver work? Some people would think so. No, it, you have to have things that bend, especially if you're doing uh, trim and stuff like that. You have stuff that bend that stuff. You need special tools. You wouldn't lay concrete with a hammer and a drill, would you, brother? No, you need a special equipment. You have to get specialized equipment, and that's what some of us need to be. We need to be specialized. And with God, you have different abilities than I have. Some of you can sing a lot better than I can. Play musical instruments a lot better than I can. A lot of, and some of you people are bolder than I can. Some of you guys have, have great writing skills and in, in, in able to do that. Do it. And if you need something else, equip yourself to do that. And we as spiritual leaders, as, as they call them, I hate putting titles. I, I hate titles. Be honest. I don't like call, standing up here and saying, I am your pastor. I'm your brother. I'm your servant. But I feel it's my obligation to, as a teacher, I consider myself a teacher more than anything else, 
is to instruct you in the ways of the Lord. Instruct you why the Bible says we need to do this. Why we need to pray. Why we need to read our Bible. Some don't know how to read the Bible. Or how to study the Bible. They can read it. You can read this just like a book. Like I said, I've read it several times. but I can't remember all of it. I can't remember a great majority of it. But when I study something, that gets ingrained in me. Gets down in my heart more than that. Colossians 1, 24 and 29 says, Who now rejoice in the sufferings for you and fill up, fill up that which is behind the afflictions of Christ in the, my flesh? Boy, I, my tongue is, I got these new teeth. Uh, take them out. <laughs> I can speak better without my teeth. <laughs> I know, crazy. <laughs> Whew. Okay. We now rejoice in my suffering. See, I'm better already. For you will fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ and my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church, whereof I am made a minister. Here's Paul saying that. I am a minister. According to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you, to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which has been hid from the ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to the saints, to whom God who had made... Now you got me lost. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of the mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, who may preach, we preach, warning every man. We're supposed to warn people. Teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Am I perfect? In Christ Jesus, we can be made. The Bible says that. We are to present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his work, which maketh worketh to me mightily. A good example of how the Word of God gives an explanation of something out of the hows and the whys is found in Ephesians 13, 6, 13 to 7. Now, wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins gored about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel. Above all, taking the shield of faith. Yep, and the helmet. And, um, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, is what? Now, what is that? It is often called what? The armor of God that we are supposed to put on every day. Now, do you, are you specifically know each p p a piece of equipment there? Can you visualize what the are? But so this is what we should do every day, right? Take the armor of God. But why? Why do we need to take the armor of God? Look at the preceding verses. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that we may be able to withstand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rules of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That is the why we should put on the form of God. For we're in a battle. And our enemy is who? Satan, who has corrupted the world, corrupted the governments. But our battle is against him. And to withstand that battle, we need to put on this whole armor of God. How do you do that? Well, verse 16, verse 18 tells us this. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. That is how we put on the full armor of God. We pray always. Pray in the Spirit. Pray in God. When you get up in the morning, you say, Lord, I know I'm going to be in the battle today. I know there's going to be someone that's going to be out there that's going to stop in front of me and not let me through. Help me to be able to withstand, to keep my mind clear, to, keep my, to pray for them instead of cursing them. We know we're going to have people that we're going to post something and they're going to attack us. But Lord, we have the sword of the Spirit. 
We have the shield of faith to knock those darts down. Visualize that. Visualize the helmet. I pray that each one, Lord, put, I'm praying the helmet of salvation upon me. Lord, I want my feet shot with the preparation of God, gospel, Lord. I want to be ready to go to wherever you send me to talk to them about you, Jesus. I want my loins girded about with truth. Lord, help me not to take anything from the word. Sometimes we think we support the word by our teaching, by our preaching. It's, the word stands by itself. It supports us. Let's be truthful about the, uh, what the word of God says. Not, to, not changing it. When someone says to you, well, I just said a sinner's prayer, so I'm saved. What do you say? Well, show me in the Word of God that sinner is mentioned in there. How, how does that fit up with I'm when you're, born, you're born again? You must be born again in the water of the Spirit. How does it line up? Well, the Bible said what you just read it in Romans. Uh, whoever confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord shall be saved. Are you able to defend that? You got to go to the Acts. The Acts of the beginning of the church. Now we say, he says, who's, who's the book of Romans written to? Who? Amen. They were already saved. I could take any verse in the Gospels and tell them that's how you get saved. All you have to do is believe. All you have to do is confess. Only well, one verse is uh, you're saved by faith, not by works. So there's nothing. You, by that, you shouldn't even have to come up and say the sinner's prayer because that's a work. Exactly. That's, it, that's written that people are saved. You should never read those verses until you are saved the Bible way. X2, X238, X10, X19. Those are all examples of people getting saved. Now, I don't attack them when I say that. I say, well, I'm glad you have made that commitment to Christ. But there's more. The Bible says repent. And a lot of times that's people... They truly repent when they say, when they come up before the Lord. I did. I repented of God before I got the Holy Ghost. And my life was changed. Sometimes we use that as saying, well, see, God changed my life because I, all I had to do was that. I confessed Christ as my Savior. I, you know, I said, Lord, I'm sorry for the horrible person I've been. And God honors that. God will change that. But something inside me knew that wasn't it. That wasn't enough. There was a gentleman, I remember when I was working at GM in Delco, Milwaukee. A supervisor came and we were reading, we had these little, you know, New Testament Bibles we were reading, me and this other guy. And, and I didn't even know this because this guy's mouth was filthy and he was kind of rotten to people. He said, Oh, you guys are Christians, huh? I was like, um, I was new to this, so I was like, yeah, I, I don't know. So what do you believe? So I believe Jesus died for my sins, rose again, and one day he's coming to get us. You are saved. I thought, really? That doesn't match up to what I read. So when someone told me you, need, you had to be born again, that you could need to repent and you need to be baptized in Jesus' name, I was so Excited. You should be excited about getting baptized in Jesus' name. Not some churches have every six months or a year they'll have a baptism service. No, I ain't waiting that long. You don't know what's gonna happen between now and then. We'll go down the Rock River and baptize you if we have to. I don't care. We prefer to do it in this nice, clean tank when it's full of water. Hallelujah. Today is a day of salvation. Not six months from now. Well, you just missed our baptism service. You got to wait till next year. Well, I'm finding another church that will baptize me in Jesus' name. You can get the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues. 
I fall against speaking in tongues because of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13, and 14. I argued against it, saying, ah, it's just a gift. But when someone showed me in Acts 2, 30, Acts 2 that several times that God filled them with the Holy Ghost, they began to speak in our tongues. It's like, boop. Faith come by hearing and hearing the word of God. Thank God that person was equipped to answer my argument against it. And I said, I just had my Bible in my hand. I said, I need the Holy Ghost. Thank God God didn't tarry. I received that not too long after. Whew, I'm kind of going way out there. I don't know. Praise God. Hallelujah. So we have to have, be able to do the hows. Not just you need to do this. You need to read your Bible. You need to pray. Yes. Amen. We know you need to do that. But how? We are living in a generation that doesn't know hasn't been taught, doesn't even have experiences that our generation had. When you were young, everybody went to church, didn't they? Everybody. Now there's more people on the golf course coming in than there are in churches today. People don't go to church. There's various reasons why. Some of it's because they're selfish, have been, haven't been told about the love of Jesus, huh? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Everything. Even gas stations. I remember my dad had to go get gas. We were up north. He had to get gas Saturday night. Of course, some of the bars were open on Sundays. That was about it. Hallelujah. Sometimes I long for those days. Don't you? Well, we can't go out to dinner. Well, pfft. Churches got together and had dinner together. Good phase. They're even going out there again. Hallelujah. I'm going to finish up pretty soon. Ephesians 4, 11 through 12 says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. And what is their reason, Brother Dave? For the perfecting or equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. That is the purpose of those five gifts that God gave to the church. Not to self-promote, not to live till a, get a nice retirement of that. Hallelujah. I don't ever plan to retire from God's work. That may make you kind of unhappy. That's the way it is. I don't, I don't see retirement program in the Word of God. I want to preach the gospel till the day of the last breath, till he comes home. Hallelujah. As the worship team comes up, praise God.